Herzlich willkommen bei Arzt, dem YouTube-Kanal für Sport und Gesundheit. Heute bei uns im Arztgespräch Dr. Eric Kopp vom Ausbildungsinstitut Sea Health aus den USA. Eric, welcome to our channel. Thank It's you. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So the first question is Sea Health. <laughs> What is the C standing for? I get asked this question all the time. Uh, so whenever I was first starting into this field in the early 90s, uh, some of the doctors I was working with were trained in Russia. I had a chance to travel. Um, and so the R Russian word for health is Darovia, begins with a Z. So whenever I was first naming the company, it was a little bit of a tribute uh, to those early influences. I tried to change it over the years, but actually it just kind of stuck. So <laughs> we like it and everyone can remember it. It was good and yeah. it's still there. Exactly. Very nice. <laughs> So what is Sea Health doing? Can you describe that and how did it start? Yeah, um, so Sea Health right now is basically it's two names. One is for my company. Uh, more importantly, Sea Health is actually for our training curriculum. Uh, we have an extensive curriculum that is the equivalent of probably, for most people, either a master's or a doctoral degree. Um, and our specialty really is Uh, neurocentric education for physiotherapists, physicians, and sports trainers who are interested in bringing a brain-based approach into what they do with their athletes. Um, how all this got started, basically, um, in the mid-90s when I got out of school, I started working with real patients, real athletes, and although I felt like I was competent with what I had learned in school, I got frustrated very quickly with the results that you would either not be sufficient for a patient, maybe they got a little bit better, or often it just took a really long time. Uh, and the other issue within all of this was I had multiple injuries growing up, uh, and so I actually was kind of a chronic pain patient myself. And so when I was in school, I had every form of therapy you can imagine, um, and nothing really worked on me either. And so that, uh, I was lucky because I had a professor whenever I was in, um, university who had studied at that time what was modern pain neuroscience and he got me really interested in neurology and how neurology can be translated into improving movement and improving pain and that really started uh, a lot of self-exploration so I spent from really the mid-1990s until around 2002-2003 doing a lot of self-experimentation working with patients working with athletes trying to in essence, relearn uh, for, the, um, for myself how neurology worked, how the brain took care of movement, how much the brain was involved in pain control. Um, and that really has now evolved over the last 20 years into our teaching curriculum. So I tell people often, they ask me, where did it come from? I said, well, I was frustrated. Uh, I was unhappy with the results that I, that I was getting. And I see that a lot with a lot of the people coming through our courses. They are already talented professionals, but they're always looking for How can I do what I need to do for a patient or an athlete more quickly and more efficiently? So that's uh, what we focus on. Eric, you are worldwide one of the leading persons in neurocentric training. Mm -hmm. You educated lots of, of students in the meantime and trainers and therapists. Mm -hmm. So why is this kind of training and therapy so requested in the meantime? I wonder about this a lot. Um, I'm asked often why the kind of rapid growth or rapid popularity uh, of neurocentric training. And I think there are two primary reasons. Uh, number one, I think most people that work with athletes or patients for a living have some type of intuition that what they learned in school is good, but maybe that there's also something missing. Um, you know, you can talk to almost any trainer and they say, yeah, I have this patient, I have this client, I have this athlete, and everything's kind of okay, but their eyes seem weird and I don't know what to do about it. Uh, so I think we get a lot of people uh, seeking out neurocentric information because they're starting to recognize more how important uh, understanding the nervous system is to being a better practitioner. So that's number one. I think people are looking for faster results uh, as well. And one of the things that we talk a lot about in our courses um, is what's called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is a simple idea that the brain can change with repetitive training and appropriate training. And that doesn't sound that cool anymore, uh, but 20 years ago, whenever I was in school, we were taught that the brain basically stopped changing or growing at, at the age of 25. So now this whole idea that throughout the lifespan we can create new neurons, we can change pathways through practice, 
uh, I think is also driving a lot of interest in this neurocentric concept because a lot of what we do is when we teach people, we say these are the assessments to use, these are the drills to use, with the whole point of focus being can we create changes in brain structure. Um, and that's very cool because when you do it correctly, you often see changes happen very quickly. So it's often dramatic. So I think that also makes people seek out this kind of training. Mm -hmm. Can you give examples how participants, trainers and therapists mm -hmm. improve their work and their results after taking, your, taking part in your course? Yes. So one of our, um, I always tell people when I teach, I build a course, I teach courses that I wish I had been taught. So I'm a very practical guy. I try to be clear. Um, so in all of our courses, we focus on three different aspects. First, the science. Um, a lot of people, when they first come into our courses, they go, eh, I, you know, science was for school. I just want to know what to do. Uh, but I actually think understanding the basic mechanics of how the brain and body interact is really important. So we do the science. But then on a practical level, we wind up teaching a lot of assessments um, or tests that many trainers uh, and therapists, doctors haven't seen before. Or they learn them in a, um, in a manner that was very static. So we show them how to adapt things that they already know, and then we teach a lot of new tests. Uh, so for instance, uh, even at our most fundamental course, people come in, they're going to learn some visual assessments, assessments for the vestibular system, the balance system. These are things that very few people experience in school. Um, and then as a result of the assessments, then we attach to that the training drills or exercises that they can use to improve what they're finding. So like I said, it's, uh, in all of our courses, we try to give a package of here's the background information, here are the tests that you need to do, and based off the testing that you do, these are the exercises that are going to be most beneficial. And if, if someone uses your system, mm -hmm. was there anything you have been really impressed on? So what was the most <laughs> impressing result someone made with your exercises? Uh, I am, uh, I don't know. I've been doing this for so long. I have literally thousands of, I think, cool stories. Tell uh, them all. Tell them all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have time. Um, I, it's interesting because when I get asked this, people expect me typically to talk about professional athletes or Olympians because I have worked in that field. I've worked with a lot of world champions. The people that impress me the most, though, are usually the ones who have the most injury. Um, there's a, a scientist in the United States who focuses on brain injury. And one of the things that he says is it takes just as much work to recover the use of your arm after a stroke as it does to prepare for the Olympic Games. You just don't get any, you know, no money, no fame for it, but it's the same amount of work. So for me, I think the, the really cool stories are from watching people recover from very significant injuries. Um, the one that is always in the back of my mind, uh, I had a young lady come to me as a patient about 10 years ago. And what happened with her was quite unusual. She had a very severe infection, a brain infection. So they put her in the hospital. They gave her a very specific type of antibiotic that she needed in order to survive. Uh, but as a result of that, the antibiotic destroyed her vestibular system. This is a, it's a side effect of some of these very strong medications. So whenever she uh, survived the infection, but she uh, now basically had lost all sense of balance she couldn't walk. She was in a wheelchair. Um, she was then put through two years of very significant uh, vestibular rehabilitation in a hospital setting, in a neurologic rehabilitation setting. And I met her about three years after that. Um, so she was referred to me. Uh, she could basically walk. She had to use a cane. Um, and she was 26 years old at the time. So she was very young. Um, she had just gotten married when I met her, but like I said, she could not ride in a car. She could not be on a bike. She could not travel. She uh, could walk maybe 50 to 100 meters, but then she might fall. Uh, so she was very disabled as a result of this. And she was a really interesting client because I only worked with her four times. Um, we did some basic brain assessments and some kind of complicated, I would say, visual and vestibular work with her. And I saw her once uh, about every two months for that year. And each time she was getting better and better. The third time I saw her, she said, hey, I, I, I drove with my husband to the ocean, which was two hours away. It's the first time she had been in a car. Uh, and then a, almost a year after her last visit with me, uh, I got a, 
package in the mail, and it was a gift from her uh, of a stick from driftwood from the beach in a big shell uh, because she lived in Boston in the United States, and it was actually from a beach in California. She had flown across the country to California, and she sent me this little gift to say, thank you, I can actually travel now. Uh, so she actually sends me a card every year. She's moved now, has a baby, and has her, her, her life back. So, you know, I always tell people the cool thing about doing neurocentric work is if you're good at it, you can identify the problem. It's still up to the patient to do their work. And so I, I'm very, I try to be very respectful of the fact that they have to do a lot. So she's one of the ones I think a lot about. That's a very impressive story. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Neurocentric training obviously helps patients uh, getting better. Mm -hmm. You're saying it's also done to reach goals faster. Do you have an explanation for that? Yeah, so whenever we talk about neurocentric training, one of the goals is when I do an assessment on a client, I want to be very specifically targeted on what areas or portions of their nervous system are dysfunctional. One of the things that we've learned in terms of how brains work is that you can see change in brain function very, very quickly. Um, because the brain's very adaptable if I change blood flow, if I change oxygen, carbon dioxide content, but also function. So whenever you look at a what's called a functional MRI, if I'm tracking blood flow and you're laying there in a scanner and then I begin having you move your right hand, very quickly, usually within one or two seconds, we'll actually see changes in uh, blood flow and then subsequent neuronal activity in the brain. So one of our goals, obviously, is if we can find things that are dysfunctional, if we give you the right stimulus in the right amount, we typically will see very, very fast changes in either pain, range of motion issues, or strength. And that really is one of the hallmarks of what we do. Basically, we tell people, we're going to test you, we're going to create some kind of stimulus or a drill, and then we're going to immediately reassess. Because the brain changes so quickly, or at least responds so quickly, that typically you can see uh, almost immediate changes in performance with people if you do the right thing. You also will see that if you do the wrong thing. <laughs> so it's going to give you information on both sides. And that's very important for us as well, because uh, when you're in school, particularly, or you go to continuing education courses, most of the time what you're being taught are more things. Here's more tools. Here are more exercises. Uh, when often the most important thing to understand is what not to do. Knowing, you know, let's avoid this exercise. Let's avoid this particular tool. Um, because for the patient, we're really trying to figure out what is their brain like, what is their brain not like. Uh, when you do that correctly, you can see change happen very, very quickly. Cool. Can you be a bit more detailed on mm. the influence of the training on chronic pain? Yes. So chronic pain is, uh, I'll say it's almost in the, in the States, we would say it's a unique animal, right? It's, it's its own species because it has so many different parts to it. Uh, this is one of the things that we spend a lot of time discussing in our courses because modern pain neuroscience is fascinating, number one. Number two, it's a little bit complicated. But whenever you start dealing with chronic pain, one of the most important things I can tell people is if you have a patient, an athlete with chronic pain, continuing to do the same thing that they've always done probably is not going to fix it. Otherwise, it already would have fixed it. So the first thing we say is that you have to look at it differently. Um, and one of the ideas is that pain is the end result of a collection of different dysfunctions or what we would say different threats. So let's say I have knee pain, and in addition to having that knee pain, if I did a bunch of brain testing, I'd find out that I have vision problems and maybe some hearing problems, maybe some balance issues. There's so many different possibilities, and maybe I don't sleep well, and I have a bad job. Um, all the science of this tends to show us that uh, all of those different parts play into the chronic pain cycle. So whenever we're dealing with a chronic pain person, we tend to be quite in-depth in identifying these different threats and then trying to eliminate them. The one thing that I can say from having worked with chronic pain people for 20 years is that the vast majority of them that we see have some type of visual issue, some type of inner ear or vestibular problem, that when we begin addressing that, that is at least a good first step uh, into figuring out exactly what they need and addressing some of the other problems. Thanks. We support your courses with um, specific small products. Mm -hmm. 
um, that you have developed or you gave us. Yes. Um, they look totally strange to us. It's so different <laughs> from what we have ever did. What we ever did. Yeah. So can you tell us something about the meaning of the products in your mm -hmm. courses? Did you develop it? What is it for? Yeah. So most of the products that we use, I did not develop. I what I typically do is I find certain pieces of equipment and then I don't use them for their original <laughs> original use. I try and figure out ways to use them uh, for our purposes. So the small tools, uh, you'll see a lot of different tools we use for testing the visual system. Uh, we have charts and strings and beads and all these kind of crazy things. Um, we also have small handheld tools for looking at sensations of different type. So most of what you'll see in sessions that we do, um, number one, they're easy to carry around. Uh, and the reason that this is important for us is when you start doing neurocentric work, the patient really has to do something at home. It's not just about them seeing you two or three times a week. We want them to become their own therapist. So anything that requires, you know, that they change an entire room in their house and buy a bunch of equipment, it's probably not going to happen. So we try and use very simple um, tools that you can give to them or sell to them if they're a patient of yours or athlete so that they can do their work at home. Um, and then, like I said, when you go through the different tools that, that we use, they are often aimed at specific techniques uh, or specific tests that we would be uh, working on. Some of the stranger ones, we have this little, uh, it's called a Z-Vibe, it's for uh, providing vibration and texture because whenever we deal with people who have certain neurologic issues, they may lose sensation, they can't differentiate texture. We often wind up having to work around the mouth or the tongue and so that little device is, we use it for the mouth. So again, when people see it for the first time, they go, that's, that's strange, but I promise there's a reason for all of them. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So that was really interesting. Um, thank, thank you very you. much for being here today. Absolutely. Um, if the trainers and therapists want to learn more about your concept, they mm -hmm. um, will book your course mm -hmm. um, that is held in Germany as mm -hmm. well. Yes. So we actually good. we come to Germany uh, right now four to five times a year. Uh, we have multiple versions of our courses, uh, so they can find out about that online. That will be interesting. Thank you very much yeah. for being here. Wer Eric Kopp erleben möchte, kann gerne seinen Kurs buchen. Die finden seit diesem Jahr auch in Deutschland statt. Wir blenden euch den Link ein. Wenn ihr schon einen Kurs gemacht habt oder bestimmte Fragen an Eric habt, schreibt uns das sehr gerne in die Kommentare. Ansonsten würden wir uns wie immer freuen, wenn ihr unseren YouTube-Kanal abonniert. Wir blenden euch auch den Link ein zu den Produkten, die Eric in seinem Kurs verwendet. Wir bedanken uns bei euch fürs Zusehen. Vielen Dank an Eric Kopp. Eine gute Zeit euch allen. Bleibt gesund.